Our scripture passage today is quite difficult. Uh, we're going upon a disciple's life that was full of life, that had been given the Holy Spirit, who was going out around the diaspora, around those edges, preaching the kingdom of God at hand. And this is Stephen doing his work, doing what apparently he was built to do, and finally he knew it. And yet, our passage today does not end in a friendly way, does it? It ends in a very tragic case of stoning. My goodness, what can we get from this today, living through difficult times with such an end? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that even in the midst of the story today, even though we know what we know about Stephen, he had something. He had something absolutely wonderful that would carry with him not only to that last moment on earth, but well beyond that. And so why don't we just start reading and let's find out what in the world Stephen had that in the midst of all of this, we can learn from and maybe carry through our difficult times too. We read, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. How wonderful is that? I wish you could all come with me. Uh, there has been so much given and provided for this faith community that as a pastor, I get to go out the front door and bring them. Uh, even though you've dropped them off, I get to go out and deliver the goods. Do you know how wonderful that is to, to deliver food, to deliver hope, to deliver uh, this wonderful message of Christ to others? It's a wonderful thing. And Stephen is just full of it, right? Right up to the brim. He is so full of God's grace, it's just bubbling out like a pitcher filled too much full of water, just spilling all over everywhere, uh, splattering all over the ground. Just a wonderful experience. And you can imagine Stephen with a smile on his face, couldn't you, right now? Just absolutely wonderful. And yet, ah, the verses had to continue. Verse 9. Well, the world couldn't stand for someone being happy in this way, yes? Uh, loving God in this way, spreading the word of Jesus Christ crucified, yes? And so, verse 9, opposition arose. However, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. And they would go on and back and forth and these witnesses would come forth. Now this is a very serious charge. This is a very powerful body. In Stephen's life was definitely in danger. At minimum, maybe his career, his livelihood, everything around him was in jeopardy. Finally, the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this, Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me! Exclamation point. Exclamation point. In the midst of all of this, this literal trial in his life, life and death here, he responds with such confidence. What follows next in the text haunts me. Stephen had something. He really did. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of danger, he had what I lacked. This peace, this this driving purpose, this amazing brimming over of a life. What did he have? Yes, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, without a doubt. But there was a, just a certain mannerism, a certain approach that, that he would display here right to his death that I wanted. What in the world is all of this? I searched and I searched and I found something that was key to all of it. It's called contentment, Christian contentment. Not this fake, thin understanding of simplicity of our life or minimalism or, or prosperity doctrine or of all this, this cheap stuff that you have rolling around. 
I'm talking about true Christian contentment. That when you see a face and that look and that smile, when you see that life just boiling, brimming over, where is that? What is that? Where can I get it? Where can I increase my store of it? And so let's take a quick look at what con- Christian contentment really is as it focuses on these deep internal thoughts of our heart, of our soul, of our minds, really diving into the motives of our life, what we choose to do, what we don't, what God supplies for us. Let's find out what Christian contentment really is. And it starts off simple enough. Christian contentment is learned. It's not something you're born with. It's not something you can uh, take with you or buy. It, it's something you are, that, that you learn. Contentment is a skill or ability that is gained and acquired over a lifetime. And I remember coming into Paul's teachings to Philippians and really locking in on this, this Philippians 4 passage, verse 11. It says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I read through this, and, and the words that popped out, contentment, and then later on it said, I have learned the secret of being content. So you're saying I just don't just uh, suck it up, like a a magnet I don't just ingest it through the air or the oxygen we breathe it's something I have to be taught it's something I have to learn over time and trial with this wonderful word called perspective it is something that is learned that we have to somehow acquire and what's amazing about all of this is when it comes to Christian contentment until the Lord our Savior opens our eyes, until we have that relationship, until we can see the world for what it is, the, the truth of our existence, it is impossible to find true contentment. But when Jesus Christ develops this relationship, one of the exciting pieces off of a new Christian is this. They want to know more about God. They want to know more about how he thinks of them. They want to know more about what he has planned for us, this thirst of knowledge of our Lord. We want to learn, 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 learn everything we can. And contentment is just a part of that. We learn what it means to be content in need and want. We learn how to be content with much. It's, it's a wonderful skill that we pick up over a lifetime. And obviously, Stephen had gotten there. He had learned how to be calm, how to be patient, how to approach life. What a wonderful thing, right? But not only is Christian contentment learned, it's something more. Christian resentment is when we are being the best stewards possible of the gifts God has given us the best stewards possible. A steward, someone who cares for and uses these wonderful gifts of God. We read in Matthew 25, verse 14, again, I will be like a man, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. This is sort of an abbreviated account of the story of the talents, yes? We see these great gifts given to the servants, to the people that were under his privy. And they were given gifts and talents to their abilities. And so he would return later. The man who had received five talents brought the other five that he had invested. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. It's fascinating when we look at Scripture. Though we try and avoid having the wrong motives or or seeking our own gain or, or all these other pitfalls. 
what we find is when we use God's gifts, when we are good stewards with what he has, there is a bit of joy brought into our life. There is a bit of contentment brought to us just by using God's gifts that he has given to us. Isn't that interesting? That we learn this contentment, that it's about being good stewards of God's gift in our life. But Christian contentment is also when we see all that matters in life is a gift from God. Not just the possessions or like we just talked about, the gifts themselves that God wove into us in our mother's womb at some point. But it's even more. It's when we see all that matters, all that matters in life. And I think one of the best ways I've ever seen this explained is in Luther's explanation of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I know that's a long thing to say, but this is what he said, and I just love this. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, my eyes and ears and all of my members, my reason and all of my senses, and still takes care of all of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. And all this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. Wow, that's a lot, isn't it? God gives us everything from creation to life itself to the gifts we have to our possessions. Everything that you can perceive and be made aware of, these wonderful joys in our life are all given by God. And when we begin to understand this, life begins to change. How we view the world begins to change. And we start to turn a little bit towards Stephen and how he dealt with his life. Well, Christian contentment goes on. It's when we trust that God will ultimately care for the gifts that he's given us. We just heard from Luther that not only does he give it, but then he takes care of this, doesn't it? He gives us everything we need to take care of all of this. And and I hope someone hasn't kind of brought up the do not worry bit to you during all these uh, trials of the last few months. But in this case, it really matters about God caring for us and taking care of those gifts he's given us. In Matthew 6, 25, we, we read this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than your food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? In other words, the opposite of worry is what? Hmm? Peace? Contentment? God is going to not only give you these wonderful gifts, he is going to care for them because they don't belong to you. They don't belong to me. They belong to the master. And in the end, the master will train it up. It will learn it. It will cause these great results to spawn from it. He will give us the strength to use them. And then in the end, he protects this which is a wonderful gift, isn't it? Christian contentment continues. It's when our gifts are understood and are being used according to God's will. Ever hear these phrases before? On earth as it is in heaven or his will be done. There's something amazing when we find our purpose and meaning in life, when it is in line with God's will, both in heaven and now lived out here on earth that his will be done in our lives. When you understand and learn that God has a plan for you, that he's given you these gifts, that he's going to equip you with the strength to use them, and then you find out what that gift was given to you for, when you find out that meaning in your life, there's something that happens and takes over. It's darn right beautiful. 
<coughs> like Stephen, it begins to brim over in your life. It's infectious. Even if you don't believe in what someone is doing, when they know they're gifted by God and they're doing what they do, it's impossible to ignore them. Like Stephen, this God-given joy filled him to the brim with the Holy Spirit. Yes? It was a wonderful thing to watch. And he was doing what God had called him to do, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, proclaiming Jesus Christ raised, yes? That he is true Lord of all. And he did it well. <laughs> because he understood what his gifts were and he was using them according to God's will. What a wonderful thing, right? And we read in Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who loved him who have been called according to his purpose. There's something that happens when we live our purpose, hmm? when we live what God has given us. The good seems to flow. I don't mean in, in the amount of money in your bank or possessions or even health or wealth or any of that stuff, yes? There's just this wholesome good that comes to our life that adds to that contentment, adds to that position that we want in our lives that we see in Stephen. That happens when we understand and we live out the gifts in our life. It even goes on from there. Christian contentment is when our utmost desire is to use the gifts given us. Hey, you could understand how to use your gifts. You could know that they're gifted by God and still don't want to do it. Hmm. Do we know anyone in the Bible who is told what to do and was gifted to do it and said no? Um, maybe Jonah? How did that work out for him? Yeah, um, Jonah got swallowed up by a fish and barfed up on a beach somewhere because even though he understood, even though he knew he had the gift, he wasn't doing what God had called him to do. He had no desire to do it. I know how to lay fence. A lot of barbed wire has been strung in my life. Does, does that mean I want to do it for a living? No. And so Christian contentment continues to be built in our life when we desire to use these wonderful gifts given to us. Christian contentment is also built when we can freely give of our gifts, freely give of them. Now, I, I, I do admit the gifts God give me, I am using right now and I'm being compensated for my troubles. Um, and living out these gifts, but there are many in my community around me where I donate time and give freely these same gifts God gave me. We read in Matthew 10, uh, starting in the seventh verse, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. There's something special about giving freely, and this is the key. If you don't believe it belongs to you, that it's not being cared for ultimately by you, and it was gifted to you, then there's something in human nature that makes it easier for us to loan it, to give it, to allow people to use it. I don't know why that's there, it just is. Freely you have given, been given, freely give. <laughs> All right, I only have one more for you, I promise. Finally, Christian contentment is built when we are in harmony with the full body of gifts around us. The full body of the gifts that are absolutely living out around us. Okay, I love this Proverbs scripture. It's kind of fun. Proverbs 14 about this. A heart at peace gives life to the body. Hmm? A good heart pumps and it fills the entire body, doesn't it? But then Proverbs 14.30 says, But envy rots the bones. It just rots at the very core. When we're envious, when we haven't been filled with what we think we should be given, when we don't have the name we wanted to build, when we don't have what we want, it, that just rots at the very bones of our body. And yet, those who are at peace with those around them, at peace with the full body of Christ in our case. Wow, it just gives more life. 
It just fills you to the brim like we see in Stephen, just filled to the brim as he was in tune with the rest of the apostles, in tune with Jesus Christ, in tune with that great relationship with God and filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a wonderful thing to see, wasn't it? We can go on and on and on about these wonderful pieces. But if we are to truly recover, recover in our community and in our church and in our lives, these are wonderful pieces to gain from, from Stephen's life, how he dealt with difficulty, the most difficult situation of all, and have that brought into our own lives. And, and do you notice this bit of contentment happened? This is interesting. All while living in a broken and hostile environment or world, wasn't it? Whether it be Paul, whether it be Stephen, whether it be Peter, and on and on and on and on, they struggled after Jesus' death with the hate that the world would bring them. It isn't that faith requires you to suffer or requires you to, to feel this anger of the world around you. The fact is, it is because you say the name Jesus Christ. It is because you simply are a Christian that the world, the difficulties, that struggle, it just happens while we live in this world. Know that Jesus has won the fight and that we are to live here and soon we will be recovered. But there will be strife and difficulty. And for Stephen, he had this contentment, he had this peace, even in the midst of it all. We read Paul, who is not shy about talking about his struggles. Paul says this, I have worked much harder than any of you, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled. I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. <gasps> we take a breath. That's a lot, isn't it? And did I not start the contentment piece from Paul who said, I have learned to be content in all things? Are you kidding me? What is that piece? Yes, that piece is Christian contentment. Learned, appreciated understanding the gifts given us by God, knowing that he will take care of them, living them out, wanting to live them out, and truly in a world that is dangerous and desperate against Christianity. Well, now that we know all this, let's turn back to Stephen and see what happens. When we last left him, he was brought before the Sanhedrin by troublemakers making tons of false claims against him. And he said, listen to me, exclamation point. So is he going to back down? Is he, is he going to say, never mind? What's Stephen going to do here? This is what he says. If he was trying to save himself trouble, this was the last thing you say. But when you're filled with peace, when you're filled with Christian contentment, I find you're able to say these things. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You want to know how to get fired as a pastor? This is one thing you can do in front of a group of people. What was in him? Do you see that peace and, and that sense of purpose, that contentment? in him that allowed him to speak the truth. Oh boy, when they heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, 
full of the Holy Spirit, yes? It was never his strength. It was this gift of the Holy Spirit in him, right? Because again, without this relationship with Jesus, Christian contentment doesn't go anywhere. Those gifts go nowhere. The results are empty. But Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. If they weren't mad before, now they're furious that this person, well, while they were furious, yes, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. I, I can't even imagine what that would be like, and I don't want to. While they were stoning him, this the Stephen that had something that I will continue to seek and, and long for the rest of my life, prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow. You have a Lord, a God, a creator who loves you and is with you. And despite all that you're going through right now, no matter what you think, he is as close to you as your next breath. Jesus Christ lived your life, died your death, and was raised again so that you may have this beautiful gift, this gift of eternal life that starts now and continues forever with him. And while we remain here, we can have this sense of peace, this, I guess, part of contentment, this clinging on to, this, this holding on to this hope that we have that God has already won despite all of it. Jesus Christ is for you. Just as he strengthened Stephen, who is with the Lord now, so in these troubling times, we can have this peace, hope, love, and joy all because of Jesus' relationship with us.